All right, here we go. We will continue with Revelation 9, the second woe judgment, or the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is about to sound, bringing upon the world that second woe judgment. Now, translating to cowboy lingo, the inhabitants of the world will be screaming, not woe, but whoa, whoa. stop, right? Stop. They won't use our lingo. We use woe. The rest of the world use, uses stop. Yes. So, <clears throat> just to kind of give you an idea of where we are, keeping on our timeline, we see the Revelation 6 that we went through, where they went through the seal judgments all the way up through the interlude. And all of the things that happened there uh, with uh, the uh, seal judgments, the horror and the terror that was described there. And now we're into the trumpet judgments. And we saw in the first one, the hail, the second one, the asteroid. The third, we saw wormwood. And in the fourth, darkness. And all of these things were affecting the entire earth as a whole. But now the next judgments are going to be affecting individuals as well as the, the rest of the world. But we just saw in the first woe judgment the opening of the bottomless pit as John looked down upon the earth. This is the word of God from the NIV. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour, this very day, this very month, this very year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard the number. The horses and the riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. <clears throat> the power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping. Demons, and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. <clears throat> it is important to picture exactly as we can, what John is singing at this point. John has just witnessed the bottomless pit opened and the swarming locusts and the misery they brought that he saw must have been terrifying for him to behold. But now the, his attention is redirected from the earth back into the heavenly throne room. As he hears the trumpet of the sixth angel, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. You see, the Greek words here is not, <clears throat> or is more specific than what we read there in the King James Version. It says, I heard one voice, not a voice, one voice. It is specific. There is one mediator between God and man, 
That is Jesus Christ. The symbolism of the golden altar was seen in chapter 8. And just to review, it said this. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. The incense is the prayer of the saints directed through Jesus Christ. The one voice John hears is said to be not from the altar, but from the four horns of the altar. And there is a difference. Using the number four to describe the horns of the altar would, you would think, seemingly be unimportant when you're picturing the voice coming from that altar. But it is important when you're picturing Jesus Christ. You see, this number four is dramatic in its placement of John's description. And I want to show you how. In the construction of the altar of incense recorded in Exodus, some 1,500 years before the book of Revelation was written, the number of the horns of the altar of incense is never explicitly mentioned. And you might say, hmm, so? But if you compare it to the other things that are mentioned in the tabernacle, everything is so precise. The numbers are there. Everything is there so they know exactly. And there is no exceptions of how the things are to be built for the temple. But yet, we're just given dimensions for the altar of incense. Why wait 1,500 years to reveal the reason? God has a way of doing things like that. Unlike the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice, which specifically states for there to be four horns, is relative because four is the number of creation. The altar of sacrifice has four horns signified, or which it did signify, the judgment of sin throughout all of creation needing a blood sacrifice. The number was noticeably absent in the description of the golden altar of incense. Even though it's applied, the number was a very significant omission. However, we are about to be revealed because of Christ's interser intercessory work that is going to happen in heaven, the number of the horns on this altar is now stated here in Revelation, reflecting a transcendence from the earth now into the heavenly realm. This altar pictures Christ in his intercessory role. It is he who speaks for all people on the earth from every corner of it, north, south, east, and west, no one is exempt that trusts in him. He alone brings the prayers of all of the saints into the throne room before God. The events to come are happening because God's judgment is due upon the world that has martyred his saints and rejected him and his offering of peace through Jesus Christ. Israel has rejected the Lord. The people of the world have rejected the Lord. The events of Revelation are prophesied in advance to show us what will happen to both Israel and the world as the events unfold throughout history. You see, God does hear our prayers. He hears the prayers of his people who are in Christ. However, how he responds is solely up to him. 
We may think that he doesn't hear, but he does. We may think that he is unresponsive to our needs, but he is not. The plan, his plan, must come to its fulfillment, and we must be patient in the process. Boy, that was easily said, (laughs) but not easily done, is it? Patience is not our virtue, or at least it is not mine. The voice from the altar commands this, to release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. You see, the world is now going to be focused directly on Israel. They are being brought through the tribulation to the point where they will call out for Christ as a nation. This is the purpose of their final seven years under the law. It is to bring them from the Mosaic covenant that they practice into the new covenant that Jesus provided them. I heard a statistic for the year of 2023 of the number of Messianic Jewish believers in the nation of Israel today. It has springed forward to a full 1.75%. Now that is several hundred thousand. As a matter of fact, there's 40,000 Arabic Christians who live just in Nazareth alone. But in the overall population, Israel is not right with God. And it's going to take catastrophe to make that happen. It's a shame, but that's what it'll take. See, these angels are representatives of the evil forces of man. Now, this concept, this picture that you see there of the heavenly messengers, I think is most incorrect. More likely, they're demonic messengers. However, they could be imitators of good, as Satan is an imitator of light. Maybe we can't quite see it. Maybe there's a tattoo behind their right ear or on their left wing that makes them demonic. But they aren't these heavenly creatures that you might think that are pictured here. They are definitely demonic. They are released so that a great army is able to come against Israel. John says that those who are bound, and it tells us they're angels, and only demonic angels can be bound. Do we need to bind heavenly angels? Of course not. So we know that these are demonic beings. It is important to understand the biblical significance of Euphrates River in order to understand why it is even mentioned here. You see, it is the utmost point of the land that was originally promised to Abraham in Genesis. And it is the utmost point of the land that was held during the reign of Solomon. His kingdom went all the way up into the Euphrates River. Beyond this river, And since the very earliest times of biblical history, this area has been in a state of war, physically and spiritually. And all against the forces of goodness. The boundaries began actually at the time of Cain when he dwelt in the land east of Eden. as he was sent out after his murder of his brother. The two highlighted cities in this area, according to the Bible, are Jerusalem, the city of peace and the place where God dwells, and Babylon, the city of confusion and where wickedness dwells. In Genesis 14, the four kings of the area around the Euphrates come against the five kings dwelling in the land of Canaan. Later in the Bible, the king of Assyria is called the rod of God's anger in Isaiah 10 and is used as God's judgment against the northern tribes of Israel carrying them away to captivity in 1722 BC. After that the king of Babylon 
is used as God's judgment against the southern land of Judah, carrying them away in 586 B.C. In Jeremiah, Babylon is specifically called the hammer of all of the earth. Boy, can we see that today. Where is the majority of the world's conflict originating? What is east of the Euphrates River? Iraq, Iran. To the prophets, the Euphrates was the symbol of all that was disastrous in the divine judgments. Understanding the symbolism of the great river, one could just stop right here and exclaim, man, disaster is coming. We wouldn't even have to go any further. But because John knew that we wouldn't understand exactly what the Euphrates River means, he goes on and does a little more describing. But disaster is coming. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now back in verse 12, we are told that the second and third woe, or the woe judgments, must wait until the first woe is completed. Up until this point, the disasters, the confusion, the chaos portrayed are all overlapping. Remember the picture of the car at the intersection and the different views? That has been going on throughout the book of Revelations up to this point. These three woe judgments, however, are sequential and they're happening one at a time. Now, there are two prominent schools of interpretation moving forward from here. And so I want to explain to you what I feel are the two different interpretations. And those interpretations then branch out into several different things from there. But this is the primary thing that we're seeing today. And what we see is that these things that are about to take place that we're going to read are either man-made or they're demonic-made. Or in other words, they're in the physical world or they're actually in the spiritual world. Be it physical or spiritual, it is God himself causing the action. It is one of the seven spirits of God which sounds a trumpet and initiates each action. Many go the route of man-made, like the tools of war, planes, helicopters, tanks, guns, shoulder-fired missiles, personal armament. If any of you have been following the war that's going on in Gaza and you see those Israeli soldiers, I don't see how they walk they have so much stuff on. Their backs, their shoulders, their heads, they have equipment surrounding them, both to protect themselves and to be an offensive weapon. And a lot of people are very dogmatic about what John is seeing because who would have thought 2,000 years ago that these things we have today would even exist? And they most certainly could be right. Now, there are those who stand on the demonic, the spiritual side, that all of these things will be spiritual battles that are taking place. Things like supernatural agents that are causing things to happen. Demonic angels. We might think of UFOs. We don't know what they are. Even microscopic pathogens. Maybe just mental confusion that causes all of these things. But I really think, and I have no substantiation in scholars of saying this, but why can't there be a third option? Imagine for a moment an army composed of humans demonically possessed. Pharmaceutical chemicals forced upon them to enhance mind control, physical strength, and aggression. 
What about the use of chemical warfare that causes confusion and hallucinations? All planted into the creative human minds by fallen angels. They had been bound, but now they're free to do as they please and to affect us. Those that are not sealed any way they want. Able to take what God had created for good to be manipulated for evil enjoyment and their own satisfaction. Today, many people are unaware that playing computer war games has become the most popular internet pastime to the point where the country, the nation of China, is now uh, set laws in place to limit internet providers to turn off war games that are being played and that can limit them to only one or two hours a day. It's that bad in China? Imagine where there's no rules in place like that. These desensitized minds playing these games or developing a lust for destroying, killing, and conquest. The demonic hatred of all things Jewish and biblical will just slide right into the realm. And you multiply that by the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million? I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacintha blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. Out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. 200 million? 2,000 years ago, there were barely 200 million people on the earth. Who would have thought there would be 8 billion people now? It may be 5 years, it could be 10 years, it could be 30 years, it could be 100 years before all this takes, takes place. There could be 12 million people on the earth, billion people on the earth. This is something that nightmares and blockbuster horror movies are made of. We can't imagine it being in real life, but it will be. You see, no longer will the armies try to camouflage themselves into the surroundings. They will desire to stand out, to be noticed, to be intimidating. Why not? Got 200 million of them. Who cares if you lose a few hundred thousand here or there? It's like the internet games. You just got a boundless amount of ammunition. Oop, I've run out. Oop, restart the game. How intimidating will they be? Let me give you an example. Here is an example of a NATO exercise held five years ago. No sound needed. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone that you just saw, maybe, which came out of their mouths. Those that interpret it as the tools of war that John has seen, well, I could substantiate that just by that. Imagine a few hundred thousand of those, what that would create. This continues the pattern that as the judgments become more and more fierce, the Lord increasingly relies on demons and demonic influence to carry them out. See, for their power is in their mouth 
and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. See, nothing in the text seems to suggest we should take these descriptions to be symbolic representation of something else. John is being very descriptive here in what he is seeing. If so, and we see them as described, which means they may not be of this world. I ask you, have you noticed the increased interest in our leaders of Congress and the media becoming obsessed with alien beings? Have you noticed that? Interesting, isn't it? What is the definition of an alien? Something not of this world. That's it. Are angels of this world? No. Are demonic angels of this world? No. Not at least in our humanly realm. Could the UFOs, the things that people are seeing, truly be there? But just be incantations of things to come? I have no idea. John probably didn't have any good idea either. He's just telling us what he saw the best he can. The Apostle John would have been very much aware, though, of the Lord's foretelling of this very coming army from the Old Testament when it was speaking through the prophet of Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for the many successive generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds so they run. With a noise like chariots over the mountaintops, they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation. They do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon glow dark. And the stars diminish their brightness. I could see John seeing these very things and the words of Joel running through his mind. The overall scene is of an unstoppable and di disciplined force that sweeps across the land. Obviously, some will endure this judgment. But for a third of mankind, it won't be endurable. With today's population, that would be some Two and a half billion people gone from the face of the earth. I can't even imagine that. The first woe produced great suffering for everyone, but no death for anyone. The second woe produces death for some, but great suffering for everyone. And the Lord may use the suffering to bring a person to faith. 
So we wonder what will happen to the world full of grief after this second woe. Can't we see suffering bringing people to the Lord? We do today. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, they did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. See, sometimes calamity will bring people closer to God. However, however, when there's a great victory at the same time as grief, the opposite can go the other way. The dead are mourned, but the people as a whole, because of their accomplishments, feel proud and self-righteous. Boy, the ones that are left, they didn't get us, we're invincible. Is that not the way we think today? This appears to be the case here, because John says that they did not repent of the work of their hand even after all of this tragedy and terror and horror. And they did not repent even of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. They weren't sorry for anything. We see in these two verses, if one is not following the Lord Christ, they are by default following the devil. Now, that is a very, very harsh statement. Society today desires a middle ground. They want a soft little middle area. Surely, it won't be this bad this way or this bad this way. But Jesus leaves no room in the middle. He draws a very fine line in the sand. And he does so when he speaks to the Pharisees. When he says, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father, and, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, Jesus says, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. They heard, but they did not understand. They were un unwilling to understand. They didn't want to understand. The rest did not repent. Notice the completeness of John's statement. He didn't say, and some of mankind, the majority of mankind, a few of mankind, the rest. The indication is that 100% of the earth responded to these judgments without coming to faith. Now that puzzles me because of what, have we, what we have been studying. What do we know? We know that there is faith going on during this time because the 144,000 are at work saving people. There's martyrs dying. And going up into heaven. Into the incense altar. How do we reconcile these two statements? How could they contradict each other? I think it's easy. When you remember what the Bible says about how faith comes to us in the first place. Paul explains the process to the Romans. Very succinctly. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? 
Not knowing that the kindness of God is what leads you to repentance? Not the anger of God. The kindness of God. The love of God is what draws us to Him. Those willing to listen. Paul said it is the kindness of God. Meaning the grace of God working in our hearts prompts our faith to respond. So for those in the tribulation who experience the grace of God, salvation will be the result. Not of something they do. And these judgments are a part of how God prepares their hearts to receive His grace. We know that difficult circumstances are often useful to God in bringing a person to consider the end of who they really are. They begin to understand they're a sinner. They don't deserve eternal life that God originally planned for us. They begin to understand that. See, the natural man will not turn to the Lord out of calamity. That old notion about there's no atheists in foxholes, that isn't true. There's a lot of atheists in foxholes. How do I know that? Well, we've seen it. When the people come back from the foxholes, does it change their life? Occasionally. But more often than not, no real change. Even unprecedented judgments, like these woe judgments, won't convict the world to believe. You see, God knows our thoughts. He knows our reasoning. He knows our motivation. Faith isn't based as a process of fear or emotion or even absolute convincing proof right before your eyes. That won't create faith. For by grace you have been saved. How? Through faith, and that not of yourselves. What a glorious gift of God it is. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All of God's people said, Amen. and may I add, glory, hallelujah.